And thank you for joining us in the pastor's study today. Let's begin by just entering into his presence, by coming before the very throne of grace. Would you bow with me, please? Father, we know that Satan doesn't want us to hear what we're going to talk about today. He doesn't want us to deal with this issue, to look at it, to to do anything with it, to listen to it, to discover what your word says about it. And nor does he want us to be obedient to what your spirit would have us do. But Father, in these next few moments, would you clearly speak to our hearts Oh God, would you speak to us and stop anything that would draw our attention away from what you would say to us in Jesus' name, amen and amen. While we have been working our way through Luke's gospel, specifically in chapter 3, and talking about this whole issue of repentance, and when you come to Luke chapter 3, we see that There are Pharisees there, there are Sadducees there, and they're coming to hear John preach. They're coming to be baptized by him and to hear him preach. And we understand that their entire religious life was a sham. It was fabrication. It was literally a lie. They were living a lie. They were supposed to be righteous, but Jesus looks at them and he says, you're like whitened sepulchers. You're, you're, you know, have this facade on the outside, but on the inside is dead man's bones. Their entire spiritual life before God was a charade. It was a fabrication, a lie. And that's why John looks at them and he says to them, you're coming out to hear me preach, but you're a brood of vipers. You're a bunch of snakes and you've come out here to escape the wrath of God. You have no intention of embracing God's Messiah and coming before the Lord and making him Lord of your life. You're here because you just want to escape God's wrath. And that's what we looked at last time in verse 7 of Luke chapter 3. But I'm going to try to get through more than one verse today. So just settle back and make yourself comfortable for the next three hours. Just kidding. But John has told these people that they were there more for self-promotion than they were for spiritual devotion. That's what they came for. They wanted to be there to escape that wrath. It was more for self-promotion than any kind of spiritual devotion. And it really isn't unlike a lot of people in the church in our day and time. You know, they, they look for the latest spiritual experience to be a part of the what I call the latest spiritual shiver. They don't invest themselves in the local church. They, they're, they're, they flit from here to there. Can I tell you, do you know why our church, City Bible Church, has, has been around for more than 50 years? It's because of people who stay and invest their lives. And we have people here that have been here from the very get-go who've invested their lives and and paid a price, if you will, to make sure that the Word of God was upheld in our area. And that's the reality of it. But you know, the Word of God has a good deal to say about people who are so external in their Christianity. You know, they have it on the outside, but it's not in their heart. And God's Word has a great deal to say about all of that. You know, these people that say the right words, but but don't have that in their heart. If you remember in Matthew chapter 25, the parable of the bridegroom and the bridesmaids, and there were five wise virgins and five foolish virgins. And the five foolish virgins had this lamp of profession, but they didn't have the oil of salvation. And you know what? There are a lot of people in the church today who have that lamp of profession, but there's nothing of of salvation on the inside. They're missing it on their heart. And it, uh, Paul writes and talks about it in Titus chapter 1 and verse 16. Listen to this. 
He says they profess to know God, but in their works they deny him, being abominable, disobedient, and disqualified for every good work. The, the, the way they live their lives, the way they conduct themselves, the way they act, the way they behave, denies the fact that Jesus is Lord of their lives. Jesus talks about it over in Revelation chapter 3, verse 1, talking to the church at Sardis, and he says, <clears throat> he says, these things says he who has the seven spirit, spirits of God and the seven stars, I know your works, that you have a name and that you're alive, but you're dead, spiritually dead. And these people are coming to hear John preach and they're coming for baptism. But John looks at him and he says, I don't care why they're coming. I want to see fruit in their lives. I want to see that there's evidence that you are walking the walk and talking the talk. I want to see the evidence of bearing fruit in your life. And in verse 8, he says, therefore, bear fruits worthy of repentance. You see, when you come and you repent and you come before God and you cry out and you ask his forgiveness and you've repented, there's going to be a change in your life. All things are passed away. Behold, all things become new. And it doesn't mean that you instantly become a new person, not instantly. It's a process. It's, it's a chipping away, if you will, of those uh, sanding down those rough areas in our life. We don't become a super saint overnight. There's still going to be trouble along the way. But as a Christian, folks, your life needs to move in a Christ-like direction as you're being conformed to his image. It's going in that Christ-like direction. That's what Paul says over in Acts chapter 26 when he's talking to King Agrippa. And um, he's standing before this pagan king and he shares his testimony. And as he gives his testimony, I want you to listen to what he says in verse 19 and 20 of Acts chapter 26. Therefore, King Agrippa, I was not disobedient to the heavenly vision, but declared first to those in Damascus and in Jerusalem and throughout all the region of Judea and then to the Gentiles that they should repent and turn to God and do works befitting of repentance. We should have that underlined in our Bible, folks. We really should do works fitting of repentance. You see, where there's repentance in my life, there's going to be evidence of the fact that I've repented. So now let's go back to Luke chapter 3 and verse 8. And um, let, me, let me just read the verse. <clears throat> he says, Therefore bear fruits worthy of repentance, and do not begin to say to yourself, we have Abraham as our father, for I say to you, God is able to raise up children to Abraham from these stones. He's saying, don't bring Abraham into this. I don't care who your daddy is. You know, God doesn't have any grandchildren. He, th there's no such thing as grandchildren in the family of God. Just because, uh, Paul says, just because you're related to Abraham doesn't mean that you have an automatic in that you're a shoe in for heaven, that you have this automatic entrance into the kingdom of God. He says, what you had better concern yourself with is the fact that you have a fruit of, rep of, re of repentance, um, th that you've repented before God. And the reason is what he says in, in verse 9. He says, and even now the axe is laid to the root of the trees. Therefore, every tree which does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. And that's why we have to have this fruit of repentance. And then the Lord Jesus backs that up over in John chapter 15. But, but these people hear John preaching this and they, they become disturbed. They're concerned. So concerned, in fact, that in the middle of his sermon, they start to talk to him and ask him questions. Now, understand that sermons most times are not interactive. You don't have that privilege. But 
but that's what they're doing. They're, they're asking him questions. They want to know. I don't know if you've ever read Jonathan Edwards' Sinners in the Hands of an Angry God. An amazing, an amazing testimony. When people heard it that first time, they began to wail. They stood up in, in the church and began to wail. They got over to the columns that were in the center of the church and they held on because they thought the floor was going to just give away and they were going to drop into the fires of hell. You should read that sometime. You should really get a hold of it and read it. I'm sure it's online. But they began to wail and cry and pray to God to forgive them because they thought they were on their way to hell. And as John is preaching that they needed to have this fruit of repentance in their lives, they begin to talk to him. They begin to ask him questions to cry out, John, tell us what to do. What is this fruit you're talking about? What's it going to look like in our lives? Now, there are three groups of people in this passage. And this is fascinating to me because it's outlined in Scripture that they have these three groups of people there. Now, we know the scribes and Pharisees are there, but they aren't mentioned among these three groups. And the three groups are the multitudes, the tax collectors, and the soldiers. And John begins to answer the questions, and, and, and he gives them three fruits. But understand, these three fruits are not an exhaustive list. It's representative of something within the lives of these three groups of people. And the first one is the fruit of generosity. When you have that fruit of repentance in your life, generosity is going to show up. Now look at verse 10. It says, so the people asked him saying, what shall we do then? Verse 11, he answered and said to them, he who has two tunics, let him give to him who has none. And he who has food, let him do likewise. And you know, we read this and we just kind of gloss over it. Pass right over it. I mean, what on earth is a tunic? Well, in this case, it was like a long t-shirt. It was underwear. And not everybody had a tunic. The, the, the robes, you know, they, they, they wore the outer garments they would wear, the robes they wrapped themselves up in. But the tunic was, or the undergarment, if you will, was somewhat of a luxury. It's not like the way we live. I mean, we don't understand. We don't get our heads around it because it's so foreign. But these people only had one change of clothes. They didn't have a closet full, or in some cases, two closets full. Uh, but John says, if you're fortunate enough to have two tunics, give one to someone who doesn't have any. In other words, be generous. Be generous. Express your uh, repentance through generosity and do the same with your food and if there's repentance that's gone on in your life it's if it's taken place in your life it's going to show up in generosity now where does that generosity come from it comes from a heart of repentance and these jews knew this concept because they knew the scripture you shall love the, your neighbor as yourself it was a command, a command of God. And it's all the way through the scriptures. It's all through the Bible. And understand, this isn't just a financial issue. It's being a person who loves other people. And I've got to ask folks, do you have that fruit of repentance in your life, that fruit of generosity that comes from that heart of, of repentance, that, that, that heart of love? You know, the reality is, as we look at this, it really, really causes us to look within ourselves. You know, John said, if there's repentance in your life, it's going to prove that you love people more than stuff because there's a generosity towards them. But now let me give you the second thing that he talks about here. The second thing is, is that this repentance is going to be seen in honesty. Now, look at the second group of people, the tax collectors. These people were despised. They were hated by everyone. But, but 
but they're hurting. These people are hurting. They were lonely. They, they, you know, the, the people that we consider the greatest sinners in the world are still hungry for, for, for God. They're still hungry for a relationship with God because we all have this, this God-shaped vacuum in our lives. And whether they realize it and whether they admit it or not, it's still there. They are longing for a relationship. Now, let me explain something. You see, in that day and time, a Roman family could buy a franchise for taxes in a certain area. It would be like buying a Tim Hortons franchise. And they would buy that tax franchise, and then they'd hire Jews to go out and collect taxes. And the Jews that were collecting would collect a tax, and then they would add on a profit for the the, the owner of the franchise, but then they would add on a, an amount for their wage, any amount that they figured they couldn't get. And they were considered by the Jews to be traitors because here they are taking money from Jews and sending it to Rome. Rome was occupying Israel by force and they were keeping the Jews suppressed and oppressed. And these tax collectors came to John and they said, we're hungry for a relationship with God. What do we have to do to repent? And listen to what John says, says to them in verse 13. He says, collect no more than what is appointed for you. That's it. Just be honest, be fair, be just in all your dealings. Let that mark of your life be honesty. And that's what these people needed to hear, this group of people. But you know, it doesn't always have to be about money, does it? It doesn't always have to be about finances. It might be that the problem is is with the mouth and the, or the tongue. You know, some people can can use their mouths to carve up people like a Christmas turkey. They can slice and dice, but if you want to see revival break out, just just let two people who have attacked each other verbally just come and begin to repent and get things right, make restitution. I want to tell you something. If you're serious about revival, let's see you do that. You say, well, pastor, I'd like to see revival come, but I'm, I'm not that serious. You know, I'm not serious enough to do that. But that's exactly why in the church, you know, we, we don't preach about repentance. We argue about it and debate it. But we just don't do it. So now that I have you upset and uncomfortable, let me give you the last fruit that he talks about here. But let me just say this about that. The Lord Jesus Christ is not interested in our comfort. He's interested in our character. And the third fruit of repentance that we see here is integrity. He hits on generosity. He hits on on honesty, but now he comes to integrity. And he's talking to soldiers. I don't know if they're Roman soldiers or not. Doesn't make any difference, does it? They're soldiers. And some soldiers were asking him about what they needed to do. And so he hits on this issue of integrity in their lives. <clears throat> Look at verse 14. Likewise, the soldiers asked him, saying, and what shall we do? And so he said to them, do not intimidate anyone or accuse falsely and be content with your wages. He's saying, don't take money from anyone by force. Because, I mean, literally, they could just walk up to anyone and intimidate them into paying what they had. I mean, what, you, what, what, what are you going to do? It's a soldier, right? And whether it's the occupying Roman force or the Jewish temple guard, it doesn't matter. They have power. They have position. They, they have authority. And they have weapons. And John says, don't use your position to intimidate. Don't accuse anyone falsely. And, and, and don't make money or take money by force. He says, show integrity. Be a person of integrity. Don't shake people down and, and, you know, just live within your means. Be a person of integrity. <clears throat> Can I ask you to do something? 
just just close your Bibles now. And let me close with this. Would you be willing to pray for me? To pray for me to have integrity in everything I say and everything I do? You see, I never ever want to be overwhelmed by anyone or anything but the Lord Jesus Christ. Sometimes I find myself in a position where I can be vulnerable, but I need to be a man of integrity. We need to be a people of integrity because that's what John is saying. If you've repented, show yourself to be a person of integrity. John says, if there's been that genuine repentance in your life, there's going to be fruits the fruit of generosity. There's going to be the fruit of honesty and there's going to be the fruit of integrity. So let's pray about it. And with our heads bowed and our eyes closed, I'm sure most of us could say that we are a good person, that we are good people. But you know, being a good person isn't going to get us into heaven, is it? You know, paying your taxes isn't going to get you into heaven. Being, being in church isn't going to do it either. It's only when we come to the Lord Jesus Christ in, in repentance, repenting of our sin, turning from our sin. It's only then that our, 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 our eternity is secure. It's only then when we do that, our lives are going to bear witness that we've done that. There's an amazing verse over in 1 Peter chapter 4 and verse 17. It says, let the judgment begin in the house of God. And when it does, then we will bear fruit. And Father, we thank you for your word. Thank you for that reminder, Lord, that you call us to a higher standard. Oh God, that we would walk in integrity, that we would walk in honesty, that we would walk in generosity. Help us, Lord, to be all that you've called us to be. In, in Jesus' name, amen and amen.